church happy sabbath how is everyone all right do we have any visitors worshiping with us this morning oh welcome well you're only a visitor the first time the next time you come your family okay our announcement the leadership team meeting is tomorrow morning at 10 a.m please plan to attend and be on time Please start inviting your friends to save the date for March 25th, 2023. We will be having a very special guest spend the day with us, renowned actor, singer, and pastor, Clifton Davis from the hit series, That's My Mama and Amen. Please plan to attend and spend the day with us. Hospitality is now looking for brown and wild rice in addition to seasonings. Please keep that in mind when you are grocery shopping. Thank you so much for your support so far. Please note that we now have cameras strategically placed on the interior and exterior of our building to enhance our safety and security protocols. Remember to pray for each other, especially our children. 
those with health, spiritual, emotional, and relational and financial challenges. Have a blessed Sabbath. I want uh, right now, everybody that's in the building, I want in this room right now. If you're outside, bring them in. A deacon's out there, bring folks in. If they're in the multi-purpose room, I want everybody in this room right now. Everybody. Can you do that for me, somebody? Everybody that's in the multi-purpose room, can you tell them to come in here for a moment? Everybody that's outside, come in here for a minute. Everybody step in, step in. Whoever's greeting at the table, come on in. Come on in. Come on in, bring it in. Bring it in. I wanna see everybody, everybody. You too. I was looking for you. That's right, yeah, you. <sighs> Everybody, everybody, everybody inside. There we go, there we go. Bring up the screen for me for the announcements, please. I wanna see the announcements up here. Can we do that? Are y'all able to do that? It's up. Keep, go to the next slide. 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 No, no, actually back up one, back up two, back up one more. First, in-person camp meeting. Now this ain't the in-person camp meeting that we used to. Where you up there for 10 days, but it's a start. It's a start. We need to plan to go. Now, now, not just us. Camp meeting, according to the spirit of prophecy, we should be using to invite friends that we might not normally invite to church. They gonna hear some of the strongest preaching that they'll hear. They gonna hear some, now we got great music here, so this is an exclusion to the, the Macedonian church. Most folks are gonna hear better music than they normally hear. For us, at best, it can be the same. <laughs> at best, it can be the same, right? So you want to be able to invite folks. Now, go forward two more slides. Go forward. Go, go forward. Forward. Right here. Stop. Everybody's got a phone. Pull it out. I want to see it. I want to see your phones. I want to see your phones. Don't be embarrassed if you got a little flip phone still. I want to see them. I want to see, I want to see your phones. Right now, I want you to text somebody on your, from your phone that Clifton Davis is coming and he's preaching Sabbath on the 25th. Right now. Do it right now. Somebody you text, and when you text them, say text somebody else. Now, if they are interested even young people interested in being in entertainment one day should come. This guy has been on Broadway. He's actually on Broadway right now. He has been in the movies, on TV. Do you know he plays Elijah Muhammad right now on The Godfather of Harlem? Do y'all know that? He, this, this, this fella is actually doing stuff. So if we got young people that are interested in arts and entertainment, they should want to come and just meet him just to talk to him. He's actually, listen, I got Polaroid cameras. Whoever's here gonna get a free Polaroid. <laughs> I'm gonna have some volunteers. We're gonna deacons, we're gonna talk. We're gonna have, we're gonna have a, they, they're Fuji. We're gonna call it the Fuji crew. We're gonna have a crew they're going to take that Polaroid, you take your picture and just keep moving. We're going, this is time to meet and touch somebody who believes what we believe, but he's also in a, in a field that a lot of even our young people want to be in. Now, there's some folks that have been thinking about Clifton their whole life. 
<laughs> Y'all know? <laughs> From that's my mama to amen. You know, this is your chance. Get that Polaroid. Get that Polaroid. But I want you to text. Did everybody text somebody? Everybody text somebody. Great, 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 great. Now we're going to move to the more serious thing. We have to have a, a vote right now, which is why I wanted everybody really in the room, not just for those announcements, which they were very important. So last week we did the reading to the first, uh, um, it's two actions that we need to take right now as a church. And those that are on Zoom are part of this. Uh, the first action was that we increase the number of active elders that we have in the church from five to six. That's the first action. We read it yesterday. It was recommended by the Board of Elders to the board. The board voted to approve that to then recommend to the body of the church. So right now you've had this read once. You've had this read twice. Can, is somebody willing to make this motion? I'm gonna ask just Elder Green to stand up and you know, if you can make this motion. Make the motion to bring uh, Elder. No, no, this is first to increase the number to, from five to six. Make the motion to increase the number from five to six on the Motion has been made, is there a second? Second. It's been seconded. Is there a question on the motion? All those in favor say aye, raise your hands. On Zoom, I think somebody's looking at Zoom. Raise your hands. All those opposed? All right, it's carried. The second thing that we read was, as a part of this, the reason why we wanted to increase also is because you all know that Elder James Hayes, who had been a frequent flyer, <laughs> that we had put the work anyway, now officially transferred his membership amen. to Macedonia, say amen. amen. As that, he had already been an ordained elder in another church. With the transfer of his membership, uh, the elders have recommended that we invite him to be an active elder in the Macedonia church. Everybody understand what we're getting ready to do? Okay. Uh, Elder Green, you want to make that motion? Make a motion to increase the elder board to five from five to six, including uh, Elder Hayes. So a motion has been made to include Elder Hayes in that sixth position that's been opened. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Second. Is there a question to the motion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Quiet. <laughs> elder Hayes, come on up here for a second. Now, we're going to do something more formal, but, you know, he's already ordained. But, man, I just, now, I just want to see if something's different. Can you just lay something on us? Just, just give us, give us just a, a piece of something. Just have something to say to, to now the members that you are the official elder for now. <laughs> well, well, that, well, first of all, I want to say how thankful I am that you all have welcomed me with open arms since we've been here. This is absolutely the best, and I'm not saying this for coaches speak. This is absolutely the best church I've ever been involved with. You know, you all are just outstanding. You love people, you know, and you genuine and you love the Lord, and it comes across as that. So the only thing I can just say is continue being who you are and letting God continue to lead you to kingdom glory. So we're just so grateful and thankful to be here. And again, just, just from an outsider, now who's now an insider, you are a loving church active church and I want us to continue to push forward and allow God to use us to see people in the kingdom. Amen. All right. All right. We now return you to your regularly scheduled church service. Praise the Lord everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. If those are the words, I always mess up words. That's the words, amen, amen. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The Bible also told us that, 
The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Amen. Amen. And I can't wait to that day when those two verses join in holy matrimony. Because right now, this earth is not fully the Lord's. Sin still reigns on this earth. But there'll come a time where we have a new heaven and a new earth. And everywhere that you walk, we can say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray and give God praise. Lord God, we're so thankful to be in your house of worship and praise, oh God. This is a house of praise. This is a house of prayer. Miracles happen in this place. There are believers that are here in this place, God, and we believe that you can do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or of or think according to the power that worketh in us. We ask right now that your Holy Spirit reside in this place right now. It's always been your mission to dwell in and among your people. We are your people, oh God. We just ask for a transformation in this place today that the demons may flee in this place. We thank you, oh God, and we praise you now and forevermore for your worthy of the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Let us all please stand for our opening hymn, Because He Lives. 520.
because he lives, I can face tomorrow. You can be seated. Because he lives, all my fear is gone. Anybody understand what these words mean? I mean, they sound good. They sound good. You sing it well, but you understand that you don't have to have fear. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't have to have fear of my circumstances because he lives. There's problems that will come, but because I know he lives, it removes my fear. I feel good about that. Hey, hey I've been through some things and I feel, okay, I feel good about him living. Can you imagine if he didn't live? What would be your purpose in this world if he didn't live? I'm also excited about these commandments we're about to read. This is our affirmation of faith. I'm going to invite you. I'm sorry. I'm going to ask you to do give your exercise and stand back up if you will. Praise the Lord that you have limbs to move, a mouth to talk, a brain to think, eyes to read, ears to hear the words of the most high God. And honestly, this is the these are the commandments, but I'm going to say it like this. You should know them without them being on the screen. Because you say, you profess that you believe these things, so we shouldn't have the screen. I ain't going to try you today, but I might try you next week. Amen? All right, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and do all thy work, but the, the Sabbath of the Lord. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Nor thy nor thy nor thy six days the Lord made the and wherefore and you know what we sound like the mixed multitude right there we're gonna have to do that again all right let's do it from the top again Steve I want everybody on one accord amen all right, it says it again. Remember, two, six days shall thy labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For... Sounds better. Wherefore? Amen. That sounds good when we don't want a core. John 3.16 is also an affirmation of our faith. It says, For that he that might for God The last one again. For God sent his son into the world to the condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. Father God, we are thankful for your words and the testimony, God. It says, if they speak not according to the word or the testimony, it's because there is no light in them. God, allow us to be people of light and children of light because your son is light. Thank you, Lord God, even though it's raining, the sun shines in this place because we know who our Savior lives. And God, we bless you, we exalt you, we adore you in this place of worship. Give us everything that we need through your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
Sabbath, everybody. Okay, I don't think I can hear y'all. Happy Sabbath, guys. Happy Alright, it's a bit better. So today we're going to be talking about the story of Zacchaeus. Have you guys ever heard of the story of Zacchaeus? Yes. Yes? Okay, no? Alright. <laughs> so Zacchaeus did not have a lot of friends. Why, I think, why do you guys think Zacchaeus didn't have a lot of friends? Uh, do you think it was because he was too short? No? Do you think it's because he had a weird name? Why do y'all got to think that he had no friends? Oh, okay, he really knows right. All right, they didn't like him because he was a tax collector and he took too much money from people. Now, so for people who don't know what a tax collector is, a tax collector is somebody that gets money from adults like your parents and gives it to the king. So he took too much money and this made him very rich. You got a question, Jess? Yup, he took extra. And he wasn't supposed to. So, one day, Jesus was coming to town, and as we know, he is short, so he couldn't see over the crowds of people. And nobody was going to move for him because nobody liked him. So, when Jesus came to town and he couldn't see over everybody, he went and decided to climb up the tree so that he could see Jesus. Once he gets to the top of the tree, he saw Jesus and was very happy. Now, Jesus calls out to him and says, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is confused because he's thinking, why does Zacchaeus, I mean, why does Jesus know my name? So, Jesus calls out again, Zacchaeus, I want you to stay at your house. And Zacchaeus is confused because, does Jesus not know what I do? And, he does, and Jesus does know what he did and decide and still wants to go to his house so that he can give him a second chance. So when he gets to Zacchaeus' house, Zacchaeus apologizes for stealing everybody's money and promises to give it back to everyone four times more than what he took. So moral of the story is no matter what you do, no matter whatever happens, he will always give you a second chance and you can always apologize for what happened. All right. So who wants to pray? You want to pray? Anyone want to pray? All right, come on. You want to go first? Okay. Jesus, you're the first one. You're the one we be respectful. And now be respectful. And do it for everybody for coming to church. And do you pray amen? Amen. amen. All right, Aiden. Thank you, Lord, for waking up this morning. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for giving us love. Amen. 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 All right. Now go back to your seats. and say, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. No one can love us more than this Jehovah. Amen. The word said, I'll never be more loved than I am right now. That means in my, my messed up situation. That means when, when I am filthy rags, because as righteous as I might think I am, it's filthy rags. He still loves me more than ever right now. 
So I just praise God for being my Jehovah Jireh, for providing like no one else. I'm glad that he is God Almighty, that I'm not holding him up and he, he is not suspended in air because I am holding him there. So there is absolutely nothing I can do to just let him down. Because he's my father, he's going to love me regardless. There's nothing I can do that is big enough that will let him down so much that he will stop loving me. He continues to chase after us because he loves us so much. And I am so grateful to call him Jehovah Jireh. I'm so grateful to call him my provider. I'm so grateful that I'm a child of the King.
a little bit more. Is that all right? We want him to send the winds of refreshing. I want it to wash through this space. Hey, I want it to fill this space up like it did on the day of Pentecost. We just flowed all up and through the aisles. I want us to leave here different than we came in. I want us to feel his presence so close that when we walk out of here, we can say we have been with God today.
still on the part where it says if he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor how much more will he clothe you and if he watches over every sparrow how much more does he love you last time I checked the sparrow wasn't created in the image of God the last time I checked, the lilies weren't created in the image of God, but he says, if he watches over every sparrow, 
if he dresses what are you worried about if he has that much attention to detail over the sparrow how much more will he love somebody created in the image of God and you're worried about your situation if he dresses the lily with beauty and splendor how much more will he take care of your stuff we are created in the image of likeness of God and the Bible tells us he cares so much about the creation but his prized possession was you and I. So if these birds that's flying in the air don't care about where the next meal is coming from, I ought to walk in that same power and authority that my God cares about me and my circumstances. He cares about me and my situation. I don't have to worry about these bills because if he dresses the lilies, with beauty and splendor, he cares and he details and he makes sure that they're secure and sufficient. How much more? How much more? It's prayer time right now. There's a lot of space right here. And I know, I know a lot of us got some situations and circumstances. There's a lot of space right here. It also says, send the wind of refreshing. God, send your spirit. Send the wind of refreshing. God, send your glory down. Last time God sent that wind of refreshing, it was in the upper room. At the day of Pentecost, something happened marvelous. His Holy Spirit struck that place. When the believers are on one accord, is there any believers on one accord here? We all represent different things right now, different things going on in our lives, but we serve a, <laughs> we serve the God. The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 34, five through seven, It says, the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with them there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And it says, the Lord passed by before them and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and mercy, keeping mercy for thousands forgiving iniquity transgression and sins and that by no means will clear the guilty visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children and the children of the third and fourth generation our father who is awesome our father who is merciful our Father who is gracious. Our Father who is long-suffering. We thank you, God, for your character. When we didn't deserve mercy, you were merciful. When we didn't understand what grace was, you was gracious unto us. And when we, when we were short-tempered to others, God, you were long-suffering to us. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God, that we have a place to worship. We thank you, God, that we come bearing everything that we have and you told us. Come unto me. <laughs> All ye who are labor and who heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. We thank you, God, that everything that we have stored up, God, you can carry it. We're thankful, God, that we serve Jehovah Jireh. 
That means, God, you can provide everything that we need. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name will be praised in this place. God, there are spoken and unspoken prayer requests amongst us right now. Some of us, God, are struggling in our relationships. Please, God, provide direction. Some of us, God, are struggling in our homes. The devil has declared war on our homes. He has attacked marriages. We believe that there's a standard raised up the enemy. So when the floods come, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We believe it on today, God. Stand up in our homes, God, against the enemy when he tries to damage our marriages. There are situations with our children, God. The devil has a strategic attack on the young ones. And he doesn't have an age limit. He wants to attack them from when they are babies right now. God, we even hear in the news today that they want a genderless society. That is an attack on your kingdom, God. Stand up against that, Lord. Be the standard in our homes, oh God. Allow us to have the testimony of Joshua. As for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Despite what the United States of America may say about things, if it's not of God, it's not of us. We will stand with the Lord. We don't care about politicians and policy when it comes to disobeying our Savior. We will stand with the Lord as if it was for me in my house. We will serve the Lord. Allow that to be our testimony today, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father God, for everybody that's here today, God. We need a miracle. We live in a community, God, that is marginalized, oh God. We are of people who are looked and oppressed, oh God. Christianity is oppressed, oh God. Everything that we stand for, God, is now labeled as hate speech, God. Allow us to stand for righteousness. Also, God, there's some things and some people I won't mention today, God, but everybody who's on a prayer request, oh God, we just ask that you will move in their situation even right now. Allow us, God, as you said, whatever we ask for in prayer, if we believe you will answer it. Because of the prayer of the faith, of the saints in faith. And God, not to labor this prayer any longer, but there is a minister among us. I call him Uncle Rennie. Clarence Ma. He has a word today, oh God. And I ask, oh God, that you are with him as you always are. That he won't deliver his word, but your word. That we won't hear his voice, but we hear your voice through him. We thankful God for his family. And we ask God to you be especially attentive to his needs. God, we, we rebuke everything that'll come up against a sound worship today. We rebuke all distractions. Technology, God, let it be pure. Allow everything that we do and we say be to the glory to your name, God. We'll give you praise, honor, and glory, God, in believing all things that you have said unto us. And remembering this, lastly, God, if you watch over the sparrows, how much more do you love us? And if you dressed all the lilies, how much more will you clothe your prize for creation? We thank you, God, for hearing this prayer, God. Be with us always and forever, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say amen.
spirit and they were called David to play on the harp and every time David played on that harp the spirit of the Lord took over from that evil spirit so just in case there was an evil spirit today that song that music surely now is replaced with the Spirit of God. So we can rest assured God is in this place today. Let us pray, eternal and gracious Father, we stand before you. And we trust your Spirit. When you said, not by power nor by might, but by thy Spirit, saith the Lord. The man that stands before you today, use him. For your glory in Jesus name amen I've entitled my message lottery or pottery I would like to draw your attention to the children of Israel and their journey to the promised land and it all started when Joseph was sold into Egypt and because of his faithfulness to God he became a very prominent figure in the government of Egypt. And as we know that he became a problem because the children of Israel began to prosper and multiply so much that when another Pharaoh came into power, he had a secret council meeting and they decided that these Jews could become a threat if they ever decided to join forces with their enemies. Church members, this teaches us that not everybody is not happy with your blessings. Sometimes your promotion will sour others' devotion. They may smile with you, but behind your back, they're talking about you. So the Pharaoh made slaves out of God's people, and for 400 years, they afflicted them. For 400 years, he kept them so busy serving Egypt that they couldn't serve God. That's the devil's game plan. He wants us to keep us so busy with things of this world that we're too busy to serve God. But the more they were afflicted, the more they multiplied and grew until finally Pharaoh commanded that every Hebrew son that he was born would be cast into the river but he didn't know that the very river that he used as a weapon of destruction, God would use as a way of deliverance. It was from the river that the three-month-old the, the, the three baby Moses was taken and eventually rescued by Pharaoh's own daughter. Isn't that ironic? The very power that sought to slay him ended up sustaining him. Pharaoh, you ought to have known you don't mess with God's people. Pharaoh, you ought to know that before you declare war with the people of God, you better read his resume. You have to discover, if you had better read that what God has done, you better read his resume if you would have discovered that if you read his resume, that he created heaven and earth and every living creature in just six days. If you would have read his resume, you would have known that heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool and when he speaks the, the mountains quake and the earth trembles at his presence if you would have read his resume come on, come on. 
Like Isaiah said, I stood and, and I saw the Lord sitting on his throne high and lifted up and, the, and this train filled the earth. If you would have read his resume, you wouldn't have dared mess with God's people. Sometimes as Christians, we have to remind ourselves who we serve. Sometimes we allow our problems to outperform our faith. We see the problem and we know that the problem is real. We think that we think about that problem late at night and wake up with it on our mind instead of thinking about God and waking up with him in our minds. And if we would have done that, we would have discovered that the problem isn't that big. Pharaoh commanded that the sons of Israel be cast into the sea, but he didn't realize that he had just pronounced his own death because both he and his army would later end up in the Red Sea. Pharaoh and his army were destroyed because they refused to obey the word of God. So, so, so he began to plague their life. He plagued Egypt with one plague after another until Pharaoh tapped out and reluctantly surrendered. Now you have to think after going through all that, after God had whipped him down and sub into submission, you would think after going, on, going through all of that, that Pharaoh would be quiet and would think that he would sit humbly on his throne praising the God of heaven for allowing him to keep his kingdom. But instead, he started listening to that voice in his head saying, what have you done? Why? Why did you let Israel go from serving us? He started listening to that voice that sounds like him. Sometimes that voice talks to us and we think it's us, but it's really the enemy. But it sounds like us. So he gathered all of his horses and chariots and pursued after the children of Israel. Once again, he was determined to resist God's will. My grandmother used to say the hard head makes a soft behind. In spite of all that he went through, he was determined not to change. Some people never learn, regardless of how many times they were evicted from their home and still they refused to pay their bills. How many times they were arrested, they still refused to change their ways. Some people never learned. Ramsey kept on hardening his heart. Pharaoh, like many of us, determined to keep what God says let go. He kept on pursuing him, pursuing his wicked desires until God had enough of his foolishness. And he kept on pursuing the thing that he loved. He kept on pursuing that thing that he valued until he was blinded by the chase. He didn't notice the danger that he had placed his army in. He didn't notice that there was a walls of water on every side. Just waiting for God to speak to the wind and release the fury of the Red Sea. They didn't notice that the hand of God was against them until their chariot wheels fell off. You don't want to wait to serve God when your chariot wheels come off. It was then that they realized that their problem wasn't with Moses or the children of Israel. Their problem was with God. They said, let us flee from the face of Israel, from the Lord, because the Lord fighteth for them. And Pharaoh and all 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them drowned 
in the Red Sea because they wanted to hold on to what God said, let go. One day Pharaoh asked Moses, when Moses said that God sent me here and he told you to let my people go, and Pharaoh's response was, who is the Lord? that I should obey his voice. It reminded me of the question that Jesus asked Peter. He said, Peter, who do men say that I am? Peter says, some say that thou art John the Baptist or Elijah's and others, Jeremiah's or one of the prophets, but Peter, who do you say that I am and that's the question we have to ask one another who do you say that God is who do you say that he is when you there's when you are attending company picnics who do you say that God is when you're on your business trip and nobody's watching who do you say that I am? Satan doesn't care what we believe or where we worship. He doesn't care if we worship in Mecca or Jerusalem or Macedonia as long as we don't keep the commandments of God. Jesus said, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach and do them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Satan doesn't want us to keep God's commandments. In fact, he encourages us to break them. Because he wants us to live the lottery life. He wants us to live a life of chance. To take a chance and live. Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die. Commit adultery and take a chance that you don't get caught. We gamble with our lives. We gamble that we can drink alcohol without becoming an alcoholic. We can do drugs without becoming a drug addict. Gamble without being a gambler. We, it's, the, it's that lottery that, that he wants us to live. He wants us to live outside of the law. Break the speed limit. Swear in and out of traffic ignore the laws of the land live that lottery life break God's law take a chance with your soul live that lottery life pick a number pick a sin that you believe won't cost you your salvation I am not going to cheat on my wife, but man, that sister sure looks good. Pick a number. Pick a number. It's all right to tell a lie every now and then. I'm, going to, uh, rob, I'm not going to rob you, but I'll cover what you have. Pick a sin that you want, that you want to hold on to until Jesus comes. Pick a sin that you think won't cost you your salvation. Pick a sin and play the lottery with your soul. If the truth be told, we are all willing to live the lottery life than the pottery life. After God miraculously delivered his people from Egyptian bondage, he didn't lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines because uh, even though it was closer for God said if they see war, they might repent and go back to Egypt. Sometimes the easy way is not the best way. The soil of the easy way is not fertile enough for Christians to grow. 
Sometimes God shields us from a certain job, a certain position, because he knows that our spiritual characters have not matured enough to handle the stress that position may, may cause. And if we're pressed too hard, we'll begin to speak Egyptian language. All of us have been born and raised in, into Egypt and we know how to speak its language when somebody is taking us the wrong way. We know how to speak Egyptian language when the enemy mocks us and curses us. We know how to respond like an Egyptian and tell them what we think about. So God has to take us the long way to the promised lands to prepare us for a life after Egypt because we're not really ready for war. God led Moses and the children of Israel from the Red Sea to the wilderness so that we might understand that there is a wilderness between us and the promised land, between Egypt and the promised land. In other words, there's a purpose for the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of testing, a place of examination and determination. It's a place of doubt or assurance a place of faith or unbelief. It's a place of despair or repair. The wilderness is an uncomfortable place. It can be annoying and frustrating. The wilderness is a place that will challenge your faith. Does anybody know about the wilderness? The fear of losing your house, your car, your career is in the wilderness. You might lose your loved ones in the wilderness. The pain of a rebellious son or daughter is in the wilderness. The pressures of raising a family is in the wilderness. We may not like the wilderness, but the wilderness is a place that we have to go through to get to the promised land. Yeah. Look at Joseph with his coat of many colors. He was hated by his brothers, but loved by his father. He experienced every high and low that anyone could imagine, not because of some crime that he committed, but because God allowed the enemy to try his faith. Joseph is one of the best examples of how to respond to a life in the wilderness. When he was cast into the pit, he trusted in God. When he was sold into slavery and chained like a savage beast. When he was promoted to Pontipus' house and then demoted to prison. He still trusted in God. And there's no record of him wavering nor doubting the will of God. In fact, when he met his brothers, he understood that they may have tried to destroy his dream, but God made his dream come true. So he said to his brothers, with no revenge and animosity in his heart, he said, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Every Christian must believe that our faith must not be anchored deeper than our speech. Our faith must not be anchored, must rather our faith must be anchored belief beneath our faith, anchored deeper than our speech. We can't honor God with our lips and proclaim with our mouths that we trust him even though it may be sincere in our hearts but if the truth be told we can preach the best sermon 
We can sing a glorious song. We can confess that we trust Jesus, but we really don't know if our faith is strong enough, if our trust is deep enough. We really don't know how much we believe in his word until we experience life. In the wilderness. Children of Israel was excited to be delivered from bondage. But now their faith would be tested. It's been three days since their deliverance. And as, as, and as far as they could see, there was no water. Three days without water. Three days looking for something to quench their thirst, looking for a Wawa, looking for a Walmart, a 7-Eleven, someplace to quench their thirst. And finally they saw it from a distance. Water. And you can imagine the excitement of the, the multitude shouting with joy as they anticipated a nice, cold, refreshing drink. But when they got there, they discovered that the water was bitter. How disappointed they must have been. How frustrated they must have been. They're thirsty and in the presence of all of this water, but they can't drink it because it's bitter. They're in the presence of an answered prayer, but they can't enjoy it. It's like you pray for a new house and the prayer was answered, but the roof leaks. You pray to be married, but marriage is not what you expected. Brothers and sisters, what happens when we're looking for sweet, but we receive bitter? How does we respond to bitterness? How do we respond when we expect one thing and we get another? When we expect our marriage to be sweet, but it's bitter. We expect to be promoted, but we're not. We, we expect the waiter to be kind, but they're not. When we expect our food to be hot, but it's cold. How do we respond to bitterness? The children of Israel began to murmur against Moses, saying, Moses, what are you doing, man? Is this some kind of joke? What shall we drink? Already they forgot the goodness and power of God. They forgot how their children had been spared when the destroying angel killed all of the firstborn. They forgot the grand display of divine power at the Red Sea. They forgot that their enemies in trying to follow them had been overwhelmed by the waters of the sea. Sister White said, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way that the Lord has led us in the past. Anytime we forget how God has led us in the past and we open the door to unbelief and discouragement and instead of encouraging ourselves on how good, how God is and how God delivered us in the past, we become desperate and depressed and ready to abandon our faith. Brothers and sisters, if the just shall live by faith, then we will certainly experience moments that we think God has forsaken us. Yet we must never be discouraged. I like what Habakkuk said in Habakkuk 317 when he said as, as bad as things look to Habakkuk, Habakkuk said, uh-uh, he said, even though the fig trees have no fruit and no grapes grow on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields produce 
no grain, even though the sheep all die and the cattle stalls are empty, I, I will still be joyful and glad because the Lord God is my Savior. Brothers and sisters, that's what faith sounds like. That's what faith is. That's what it looks like. In spite of what he saw, he believed that the Lord was able. That's what I call digital faith. Digital faith is like a digital clock. You see it better in the dark. Sometimes that's all you can see late at night is that digital clock. It's engulfed in darkness, but still you can see what time it is. Digital faith is best seen in the dark. I remember the time that I was laid off and I had two kids and my wife was pregnant with the third. It was dark time for me. And when I received my first unemployment check, I had to choose between chance or faith, the lottery life or the pottery life. Should I rob God of his tithes and offerings or take a chance? And that things would be, and spend that money and take a chance that things would work out. It was a dark and difficult time for me. What should I do? I have two kids and my wife is pregnant. In one hand is an unemployment check, about half of my weekly paycheck. But in my heart is a God that I trust. So I said, if I lose my house, if I lose everything I have, I will always obey the word of God. That's what I call digital faith. It's a faith that you can see in the midst of darkness. Now I have to give my wife a lot of credit because I was sure that we will go to war on this, on this issue. I was certain of that. One check, half of what I generally get, I got to give my wife credit. I was prepared for war, but she never said a word nor questioned my decision. Only God can do such a thing. Brothers and sisters, I've learned that God allows storms in our lives not to break us, but to make us. One day we had to take my son to the hospital to get stitches. And the boy thought they were trying to kill him. But we understood that they were really trying to heal him. We understood that his tears would be for a moment, but his healing would last his lifetime. We understood that the thing that was causing him so much discomfort was the very thing that he needed to bring healing. Church family, we all have been injured and wounded by sin. So don't let the process of God's stitching discourage us to leave the church. As Christians, we must learn how to be a good patient. The adjective of patience is bearing pain or trials calmly and without complaint. We must learn how to be a good patient. Every nurse knows that all patients are not good. Some patients, all they do is complain. As Christians, we must calmly respond to misfortune like God would have us. We must calmly respond to things that irritate us, that annoy us, that causes us pain and grief. We have to be a good patient. The scripture says, let us run with patience. The race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. 
What joy was at the cross? He said, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, we are in a good hands. We're in the hands of the potter. One day God told Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause thee to hear my words. And when he went there, he noticed what the potter was doing, his work on the wheels. He noticed that the vessel that he made of clay was marred. It was damaged. It, it, that clay was imperfect. It, it was defected in character. But the good news is that imperfect and defective clay was in the hands of the potter. And the Bible says that, that, uh, that he didn't uh, throw the vessel of clay away, but he made it again another vessel. Only God can take the same vessel and make it another vessel. Only God can take a good, no good sinner and transform him into a God-fearing, commandment-keeping Christian who used to hate what he now loves. I used to hate going to church, but now I love it. I used to hate being sober, but now I love it. I used to hate the very thought of being a sheep, but now I love it. Yeah. That's how you know you're in the hands of the potter. Last year, I would have cursed somebody out for saying that to me, but now I just smile and say, I don't say a word. That's when you know you're in the hands of the pot. I don't get upset as much as I used to. This is the world because this world is not my home. And I don't need a fancy home or a fancy car or fancy clothes. I don't ask for much in this world. I don't, do, I don't need much. All I need is Jesus. And all I want is to be the potter's pottery. Just let me be your pottery. Sit me where you want and I'll explain your will in my life. I don't want to be much. I just want to be the potter's pottery. Let people look at what God has done in my life. How he changed us and made us. Don't want to be much. I just want to be the potter's pottery. Let us all stand as we lift up our voice and thank God for his mercy and grace. Maybe there's somebody here just want to be the potter's pottery. Uh, Something different about God's pottery don't break like others break. God's pottery is strong and it stands strong in the heat. In fact, in order to make good pottery, it has to be heated. Uh, we don't like the trials that we go through, but that's making you a good pottery. Uh, I just love being a pottery for God. I'd rather be a pottery than, uh, and live a life, the pottery life, than the lottery life. Tired of taking chances with my soul. Tired of taking chances that things are going to work out without God. It's not going to work out without God because without God, we're nothing. Just want to be the pottery's pottery. God, we pray that your hand will move in this marred vessel and mold it and shape it into the glory that you desire. Help us, oh God, to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name I pray. Let the church say amen. You may be seated. Maybe there's somebody here that want to give their life to God. This is your opportunity to surrender to him. Don't be like Pharaoh. Harden your heart. 
Scripture says today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Surrender to God today. The songwriter said all to Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I would ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for your spirit for being in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. down one second y'all I don't know if everybody's aware sometimes when you hear a message um, some of those messages need to be repeated this is one of those messages it's one of those messages that you have to maybe go back and listen to again because the two words being part of the pottery or the lottery those things should resonate in your spirit daily because a lot of us often often take chances with our lives with a life that doesn't actually belong to you in the first place don't play with his life his body that's his body you have it but it's his body and it belongs to him so the elders said that it's the pottery life or the lottery life. The pottery life or the lottery life. That's what you should be thinking about this week. Am I going to take chances with the body that God gave me? Or I'm going to allow him to shape in me every day, each hour of the day. Pottery life or the lottery life. I thank you for the word today, elder. It's much appreciated. Sometimes we take for granted the simple words of God. We take for granted the simple words of God. So I'm not going to have a fly uh, ties and offering time to give you because I want you to meditate on the word that you got. Amen? Deacons and ushers, please come forward. Bow your heads with me. We thank you, Lord, for the gift and for the giver. You asked us to bring all the tithes into the storehouse. So God, allow us to act in faith and belief with our monetary blessings, oh God. The money that also doesn't belong to us. The ones that you've given us, God, to finish your work. Allow us, God, to move in faith so we can finish your work by our means. We thank you, God, for the word that was given. We thank you, God, for those who are able to give, God, and those who are not able to give, God, but want to give. We praise God for their lives, too. Please be with us, God, continually in Jesus' name. Amen.
church. Just a few just announcements I want to bring back to your mind before we leave. Um, we got good news. The good news is even though this service is in, we have another service after this, which is Sabbath school. We have Sabbath school for the children. We have Sabbath school for the adults. And this is where we all participate and we learn more about God. Amen. Also, um, there is a leadership meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock. If you are part of the leadership team, make sure you are on the Zoom call in the morning at 10 o'clock. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. Make sure I ain't talking to myself. Let us close. Let's bow our heads for prayer as we close out for the benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the throne of grace with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Father, be glory, dominion, and majesty now and forevermore. God, please be with us this week as we travel. Be with us, God, in our walk. God, I remind us, God, that we are pottery life and not lottery life. Please, God, as we as we continue to seek ye first the kingdom of God, God, please do something new in our lives. Allow us to see your glory, God. Allow us to receive your glory and allow us, God, to do your will. Be with those that have to leave. Give them traveling mercies. And those of us who are staying, allow us to have a great time under the spirit of the Lord. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. We'll start Sabbath school in about 15 minutes.
Good afternoon. We want to go ahead and um, get started with um, Sabbath School. So if you're going to join us, I invite you to take a seat so we can go ahead and get started. Lesson number 10, lesson number 10, giving back, giving back. Let's start off with prayer. Father in heaven, we're grateful today that you have given us this time to spend at church at study. We ask God that as we delve into your word that your Holy Spirit will fill us and use us and dissect unto us exactly what it is that you want us to know. We thank you and we praise you in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lesson number 10, giving back. In this quarter, obviously, we have been studying about how God would desire us to use the assets that he has given us. Psalm 24, 1, which we'll look at a little later. But it says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. So God tells us point blank that I own everything. And he says, I even own you. You don't even own yourself. So God is big about staking ownership of stuff. And that's, and that's point number one. So when we begin to understand that fact, it began to simplify things because we understand, you know what? I don't even own the very clothes I'm wearing. I don't own the house that I sleep in. I own nothing. I don't even own myself. But you know what it does is it gives me comfort because I realize I'm not responsible. If I'm not the owner, then the owner is responsible. When you rent from someone, it's not your job to fix things. You call the landlord. God is our landlord, so we're not responsible for things. He is. So it begins to take that pressure off of us because we realize I'm not the owner, but he's the owner. I really like this week's lesson because it began to give us some practical things to think about in terms of how we preserve assets as we get older. Our memory text says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. That's Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. I'm on Sabbath afternoon. Let me read the commentary to you. It says, as we near the end of our earning years, our financial focus turns toward preserving our assets in anticipation of the end of life. The transition from working to retirement can be a very traumatic experience in terms of our finances. What is the best way to proceed? As people get older, they almost naturally they begin to worry about the future. The most common fears are dying too soon, before the family is taken care of, living too long, that is outliving your assets or saving, a catastrophic illness, all your resources going on at one time, or mental or physical disability. Who would take care of me? When commenting on these fears, <clears throat> Ellen G. Wright wrote, all these fears originate with Satan. If they would take the position which God have, would have them, their last days might be their best and happiest. They should lay aside anxiety and burdens and occupy their time as happily as they can and be ripening up for heaven. So, so, and she's echoing what the Bible says over in Matthew chapter 6, what it says, what it says, what? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. See, that's where we get in trouble. We focus more on the other things instead of focusing on the main thing or the main person, and that's God. Because what she's simply saying is God has set up this system that if our focus on, is on him, then he'll take care of the other things. 
We don't have to worry about, am I going to check out too soon before my family is taken care of? Or am I going to get a catastrophic illness? Or am I going to outlive the resources that I have? Now, we're not saying we're not to be mindful of those things. We can make plans and preparation, but our plans and preparation at the very heart and core of them should be with Jesus in mind. As the elder told us just a moment ago, and he reminded us what the Bible said, if God is so focused on the lilies of the field and of the sparrow, if his attention to detail is so much that he concerns himself with those things, how much more? We rob ourselves of peace when we worry about things that God don't worry about. There's nothing that God, I promise you this, if you get nothing else from this lesson, I assure you, God does not sit on his throne worrying about anything. There's nothing that keeps him out at night. The Bible says he neither slumbers nor sleep, but he ain't thinking about your trouble. Because there's nothing too big for him. He's God and God alone. So I'm learning, I never say I learned I'm learning to take the position that if God ain't worried about it, why should I be worried about it? Let's move on into Sunday's lesson. I like the title of it. It says, The Rich Fool. <laughs> uh, he was rich, but he was a fool. You know, so I, I asked myself, would I like to be rich? Not at the price of being a fool. Let's go into Luke chapter 12, verses 20. 16 through 21, it's going to be on the screen if it's not already. But someone read those for me in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yieldeth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger, build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many mm. years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. <clears throat> so again, you heard me say during this study when we have talked about God is not against us having stuff. You heard me say it again, Abraham one of the richest men to have ever lived. You know, his wealth today probably would rival Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, very rich. But Abraham was not mindful of the gifts. He was mindful of the giver. So in this parable here, you have an individual who had been blessed by God with a multitude of stuff. He had so much stuff that he didn't have the wherewithal to hold it in place. So he said, you know what, I need to go and tear down what I have to build a bigger barn to house everything I got. But he forgot one thing. He forgot that he was not the source of those blessings. So the blessing, so the he so since he was not the source of the blessing, he should not be the one making the decisions about them. So this is all about decision making. He made, it's, again, I want to clear to you, there's nothing wrong with making preparation. He was making preparation for his future, but he left out a key ingredient. It's sort of like making a cake, but putting no sugar in it. I don't, know. I don't want a slice of that cake. It ain't going to taste too good. He left out the main ingredient, and that's Jesus Christ. We got to consult God when we're making all decisions, especially financial decisions. So again, God has no problem with us making preparation, making plans, which we're going to see later on. We to, are to diligently consider our finances, but it's in the context of Jesus Christ that we should look at them. Let me read this come to him. I'm going to get into this starting on Sunday's lesson. It says, though the message is broader than this, 
One could argue that this was a story about Jesus told us about what not to do in retirement. In retirement. Accordingly, if a person is quitting work to spend his accumulated assets on himself, he should be aware and take the story to heart. So in other words, it said when you are planning for retirement, which again, we all should do that. If God should tarry and we get to the time of retirement age, we should plan for retirement. However, we should plan for retirement in mind with Jesus Christ at the forefront. Lord, what would you have me to do with these assets? I tell my wife this all the time, and we teach our children this. God gives us more not to benefit us alone, but to share with those who have a need. Jesus said in himself when they were trying to clock him about uh, the alabaster box. And he said, look, the poor you're going to always have with you. And you can do right by them then. God blesses us with more because he wants to use us to do more. God gives us resources to be a blessing. So it's all about decision making. This fool made a foolish decision. He didn't include Jesus as the source. He didn't realize, he thought that he had all of this wealth, he had amassed all of this fortune because of his uh, uh, um, mindset. I have a friend of mine back in South Carolina, a young man actually used to work with me, um, uh, very intelligent young man, my wife knows what I'm talking about, Tyler, Tyler Kirk. Um, very smart, very intelligent. Um, after I left and got uh, moved up here, he ended up getting a job at a neighboring county, and he's doing, I, I keep in touch with him. He's doing very well, and he's accumulated a lot of, of good fortune. But the young man is an atheist. He has no concept of God. He believes not in God. He thinks everything that he's done is a byproduct of his hard work. That's a fool. I love him to death, but that's a fool. Whenever we think that we're doing something on our own and we leave Jesus out of the equation, that's a foolish decision. And pretty soon, all we got to do is read the story. It will come and bite us back in the caboose. So point number one, don't be a rich fool. Let's go on to Monday's lesson. You can't take it, which, and by all means, anybody got any questions or comments, we appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. We live in this world as, at this time where there are a lot of us that want to keep up with the Joneses. That's right. You know, we want to have what they have. That's right. All to sometimes lose our soul. That's you right. know, so it helped me to see that that focus is so against God. That's right. You know, we truly have to keep our eyes on God and know that the things that He gives us as That's stewards right. over. It's for his cause. That's right. And not to try to keep up with the Joneses, but keep up with the character of Christ. Amen. And know that we, sh we are here to be able to help others as God gives to us. So I'm thankful for this lesson because of that. It helped me to refocus, you know, not to look at, well, how am I going to live, you know, to be older? Or how am I going to live to do this, that, or the other? To That's be right. To be like the other people. But how Amen. can I live to be of glory to God? That's right. And, and I'm glad you brought that up, sister, because I want to piggyback off something that you said. Um, to the extent of losing one's soul, you know, it, it said, what, in fact, Jesus put it this way, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? There's some people God can't trust to bless because he knows if he do it, they are doomed to hell. Some people cannot handle assets in Jesus in the same breath. They can't. Because they're going to put him below the asset. They're going to exalt their assets above Jesus Christ, not realizing that he is our, should be our MVP, our most valuable possession. Jesus should be that. So, like the dear sister said, we got to learn how to weigh in the balance What's more important, what I'm accumulating, what I'm preparing, or who prepared it for me? And that's Jesus Christ. So let's move on to Monday's lesson. He said, you can't take away. I'm, I'm going to read some of the scriptures for you. 40, Psalm 49, 17 says, for when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. 
1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 7 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we, carry, we will carry nothing out. Psalm 39, 11 said, When thou with rebuke thou correct man for iniquity, thou makest him his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity, Selah. And the last one, James 4, 14 says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appear for a little time and then vanish away. I, I like that verse because it's telling us, and, it, and it gets this, that don't mean no matter how long you live, if God would bless you to live into the triple digits, compared to eternity, that's just a blip. You're like a smoke and then you vaporized. And none of the things that you accumulate will go with you. I remember years ago, uh, 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 Jet or Ebony magazine showed a pimp being buried in this Cadillac. Now, the last time I checked, when they put him in the ground, he wasn't going to be going nowhere in that Cadillac. We were born naked. We came in, not just physically, but we owned nothing when we came in. And when we check out, if Jesus should not come, we're not taking anything with us other than the character that God has allowed us to, or, or we have chosen during this lifetime. I'm on Monday's list. Let me read something to you on Monday's. It says, not only does life go by quickly, but when you die, you take nothing with you, at least of the material goods that you have accumulated. Character, that's another story. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away, Psalm 49, 17, which means that he or she leaves it behind for someone else to get. Who will get it, of course, depends on what plans are made beforehand. And so this is what the lesson is talking about. It's talking about what are we doing with God's resources, not only while we're here, but what plans do we make after we check out with God's still because they still belong to him. And we have a responsibility not only to care for our loved ones, but even in death, still putting forth assets for God's work to care for. If we really uh, truly believe that Jesus is on his way back, even if we cease breathing, there are things that we can do to carry that work forward. That's a legacy that we want to leave to not only benefit our children, but benefit others to go into the kingdom. Amen? Let's go on to Tuesday's lesson. Someone, if he will, um, you can grab the mic. Read Proverbs chapter 27, verses 23 through 27. Pro I love these verses. Proverbs chapter 27, because it's giving us practical advice on what we need to be doing. Proverbs chapter 27, verses 23 to 27. Know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds. For riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. When the grass disappears, the new growth is seen, and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in. The lambs will be for your clothing, and the goats will bring the price of a field. And there will be goat's milk enough for your food, for the food of your household, and sustenance <clears throat> of, for your maidens. Amen. So let's put this in 2023 terms. The Bible was written for an agricultural society. So the Bible went so it was towards the agricultural society. So God put it in terms of what was wealth during that time. You know, their herds, their flocks, their barns, their crops. So what it was so so the verses were saying, you know what? Go and investigate what you have on hand. Look at your flocks, look at your herds, look at your barns, see what assets you have. Nowadays, in other words, look at your 401k plan, look at your retirement plan, look at your bank statement. I like the first one. Do a debt to asset ratio. In other words, if your liabilities are always outweighing your assets because you continue to go into debt, that may be a problem. Because you're you really are robbing today 
by, by using tomorrow's fund. How many times have I heard a person say, man, that paycheck I already spent. God has given us practical advice really on how to live. God is concerned about the total man, just like the preacher preached this morning. Are we going to live the lottery life or the pottery life? Are we going to, you know, take chances and gamble and hope it works or allow God to rebuild us and renew us and shape us and mold us? Most of us want the joy now and we don't want to go through the pain to get the joy tomorrow. God is setting us up to be a blessing if we would follow the plans that he's given us. Let me read something to you right quick. On, um, on, we're on Tuesday's lesson. It said, however much the Bible warns against the rich trampling on the poor, being greeted with their wealth, scripture never condemns wealth or people's efforts to acquire wealth, provided, of course, they don't do it dishonestly or through oppressing others. In fact, the text for today in Proverbs indicate that we should be diligent about our financial affairs in order that we may have enough for ourselves and our family. That's where the verse comes from. You should have goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household. In other words, you should have enough resources to take care of not only your household, but the household of others. Last paragraph. In short, good stewardship of what God has blessed us with not only deals with what we have while alive, but also what happens after we're gone. Because unless the Lord returns in our life, lifetime, we will one day be gone while our material possessions, where little or not, will remain behind. Hence, it's up to us to make provisions so to what have been blessed with us, to, 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 so, what, so with that what we have been blessed with can be a blessing to others and for the furtherance of God's work. So in short, it's simply saying we're to take a look at our financial affairs. We need to consider what we have, what state we're in, what choices we need to make do differently to not only live a better life now, today, but even while we're gone, God's work can still be benefited with the assets he's given up. And I'm convinced that if we go to God and we ask him for direction, we ask him for guidance, he will show us how to maximize what he's given us. A little goes a long way in the hand of God. And see, the thing about it, it's not that we're saying that you got to be a very rich person to do it. You simply got to utilize what you already have on hand. Years ago, there used to be a show back in the 80s by a man by the name of MacGyver. MacGyver would basically get out of any situation utilizing the tools he had at his disposal. God is simply saying, you know what? Take what I give you, return it back to me. Because a little in your, my hand becomes a whole lot. So it all goes back to who are we investing in? We're either investing in ourselves, living a lottery life, or we're investing in Jesus, living a pottery life. God is teaching us how to learn and trust and depend on him. And see, but, but you know what? That's difficult for us to do because we're creatures that are motivated by sight. But when you're dealing with God, I learned a long time ago, you can't walk by what these things here show you. He says you got to walk by faith and not by sight. Peter taught us that when there was a raging storm, and, and he said, Jesus, if it be you, Lord, bid me come to you. And Jesus gave him the uh, commandment or the directive to come. And as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was able to do the impossible. He was walking on water in the midst of the storm. But as soon as he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. But I love this part of the story. He only had to say a couple of words, Lord, save me. And the Bible says immediately. No delay. Jesus reached out his hand and snatched his faithless servant. You and I would do the same thing in our situation. We may be sinking in our financial situation. But if we reach out and say, Lord, save me, I know for a fact, because he did it for me, he will reach you, he will reach out and pull you out of your situation and put you on solid ground. So what we're learning from this lesson is practical things that we can do. Again, this study enough, and again, 
We know it's hard choices. Again, the elder gave us a great testimony. I've been in it. <clears throat> when me and my wife had our third child, six, uh, what is it, 2014, she was working, and, and, and her, all of her paycheck was going toward daycare. You know, I didn't have the type of income I was making now. So when we was having the third one, we said, you know, you might as well come to the house. Because all your check is going toward. But that meant that her paycheck, well, now instead of being a two-paycheck family, we're going to be a one-paycheck family. And I remember wrestling with God on the tithe and offering thing. I said, Lord, this math don't add up here. I know you do the new math, but I'm still on the old math. This ain't working. But on that Friday night, when I made a decision, as hard as it was, I said, I'm going to trust you. And then, once I decided, you know what, that he was in charge and I was going to follow it his way, that's when stuff started happening. Because he learned, he taught me that it's not about me. It's about him. And that's the basic necessity of what we're talking about. We got to get to a point in our Christian experience, in everything we do, we realize, you know what, it ain't about, even when I pray, and I request things from God, nothing wrong with that. But I like Jesus' model for prayer. He did it in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went to his daddy and he said, Lord, if it's possible, remove this cup. But then he said, the nevertheless part. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. And you know what? That's where peace comes in. Because you presented to God, you said, Lord, I, I'd like for you to do it this way. But if not, I trust you enough that no matter what route you choose, I'm okay with it. And you can walk in peace knowing that no matter what the results are, you've given it to your daddy. And your daddy will take care of it. Amen? Amen. Let's go on to Wednesday's lesson. I like this part. Deathbed charity. Deathbed charity. Um, it's only a few um, verses, and I'll read them for the sake of time. Uh, deathbed charity. The first one says, uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17. It says, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but the living God who give us richly all things to enjoy. 2 Corinthians 4, 18 says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Last one, last, next to the last one. Proverbs 38, 30, verse 8 says, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Last one, Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Deathbed charity is simply was talking about individuals who have made a conscious decision that they're not going to do anything for God while they're living. I'm having too much fun with this money. And they quiet their conscience. Well, you know what? When I'm getting ready to die, I help somebody. Die. Can you think about that for a moment? Can you, I want you to think about this, the utter foolishness of that. And I want to give you an example. Just think about someone who has gallons and gallons of water on a hot day. And they're out at a picnic. And this family who's struggling has no water. And instead of them helping that family, they say, you know what? At the end of the day, when we're getting ready to leave, you can have what we have left over. But you have individuals like that who God has blessed immensely. And who can be a benefit to individuals now, not only financially, but spiritually through the um, spreading of the gospel. But they hold on to that with a serpent's grip. And they say, you know what? I will do something on my deathbed. And you know, and you know the only reason why they choose to do it then? Because they're going to be no longer around to enjoy it themselves. Not because they really have a heart to serve. God is concerned about our, and that's what the thing, and that's the thing I want to focus on, man. It's our attitude that God is concerned about. He has no problem with us having wealth. He blesses us to have it. But it's our mindset towards stuff. 
And when you really think about it, it's an arrogant mindset because he's the one who equipped you to get it in the first place. Sister. Where you to bless others with it, yes. But nobody really tells you how you bless somebody. You can't just go up to someone and hand them money. And I remember an older lady at church one time they were discussing that, and she said, for instance, if you can afford to have somebody come cut your grass, yes, don't you cut it. You pay somebody else to cut it. That's blessing them. Amen. Amen. You know if if amen. And we amen. We we don't realize I just like, like the business. I, I had a business. They told me I was a blessing because some of the business I could have done myself. That's right. But I hired people to do it for Amen. me. Amen. Therefore, giving them the money that God gave me. Amen. I like that. I was a blessing to them. That's right. And, that, and that's a good point. That's a good point. Because, you know, what's the old adage? If you give someone a fish sandwich, you feed them for a day. But if you teach them how to fish, you fed them for a lifetime. So that's a very good point utilizing our resources to enable others. So that individual, you need your grass cut. Sure, you can cut it yourself, but you know this family down the street has a little boy who can cut it for you, which will not only benefit you because you're getting your grass cut, but you can enable that person to be able to earn a little bit of income for themselves and help out with their material needs. And that's what God wants. And you know what? And that's the right mentality that God is seeking to put in us to be able to use us to bless others. God is looking for people to have a servant mentality, a service mentality. Let me read, I'm on um, Wednesday's lesson. Let me read something for you from Sunday, Wednesday's lesson. In the context of being a good steward and planning for death, one danger that people face is the temptation to hoard assets now justifying that hoarding with the idea, well, when I die, I can give it all the way then. Though better than just spending it all now, one billionaire had said when he knew he would be living right, only he had checked. If, the only, if only the check he had for his funeral had bounced, I say. <laughs> so in other words, that's where I will leave that. We can and should do better than that. So in other words, the whole focal point is this here. God wants us to realize there are people who now could benefit from the resources he's given us. And he wants to use us to be a blessing to them. But it all comes down to our mentality and our mindset. And the thing about God I love about it is he leaves that choice up to you. God does not force anyone's hand. Adam and Eve, he laid it out. Let's look at them in the Garden of Eden. They were given everything in the garden that they need. They were given the food that they needed to eat. They were given relationship not only with each other, but the entertainment and enjoyment of animals, everything. And there's only one prohibition. He said, look, don't eat from that tree that's in the midst of the garden. Only prohibition. But they trusted themselves more than they trusted God. And the results, and you know the results of what happened. We're in the state that we're currently in. They misused the assets that God had given them. And you know the asset we misuse more than anything? The power of choice. Because instead of choosing what God wants us to do, we choose what we want to do. And often our choice lands us in trouble. Let's finish up now. Spiritual legacy number 13. I mean lesson number, I mean Thursday's lesson. <clears throat> A lot of scriptures on this, and I'll read them for you. But they all got a common thread. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. Hebrews 3, 4. For every house is built by some man, some man, but he that built all things is God. For every beast of the forest is mine, and a cattle upon a thousand hills. Genesis 4, 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Who is the image, Colossians 1, 15 through 17, verse 15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by excuse me, 
and by him all things consist. I simply call those scriptures right there the cop scriptures because God is the creator, the owner, and the possessor of all things. God tells us point blank that he owns everything, he owns everyone, and everything is subsidized or consists by his grace alone. I was thinking just this morning that I'm, that I'm alive today, as each one of us are, simply because of his grace. And let's think about, I want you to think about this for a moment. The only reason you and I are alive and well today is simply because of God's mercy. Not everyone crossed into March 11, 2023. And, 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 and that had, a lot of that had nothing to do with how well they were doing. Because some people just died young because of an accident or whatever. You and I could have died coming through the birth canal. Or could, we could have died when we were 17 years old. Or we could have died last night. But the fact that God allows us daily to live, move, and have our being, for that fact, and that fact alone, we owe him worship. And it's a part of that worship is how we take care of his resources. Oftentimes, we limit worship to come in here on Sabbath and have a good time. But worship is how we live our life 24-7. The elder told us, both elders reminded us this morning, on how we either we gambling on God's life, on the life that he's given us, a lottery life, or we're doing the pottery life. We're submitting ourselves to it. This is not a long lesson this week, but it gives us practical advice. So I conclude and, and summarize this by simply saying, examine your affairs. Examine your finances. Take a, this, take, be transparent with God. And even if you fall in short, because we all do. We all do. The Bible said all have sinned. There's not a man, woman amongst us who has not fallen short. God values honesty and being transparent. But I love the fact that God is a great traffic director. He will allow you to make U-turns. So you've been going down the wrong path. He will turn you around. And with his help, don't think the devil, this is what the devil does. One of his masterful tricks is to get you by yourself, beat you up in the corner. You got to understand, it's a mind game with him. He wants to torment you to a point of discouragement where you totally give up. But as long as you got Jesus as your referee, you never have to tap out. Because you realize you have someone greater than you that can win this battle. So my encouragement to you this week is to take an assessment of your financial affairs. Allow God to plot the course. Don't you plot it. We already know the end result of that. And allow God to lead you to the heights and the, uh, the heights that he wants you to go. Because with, all, but with Christ, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we're grateful today. This week was a short lesson, but it gave us some practical advice on considering our affairs, or should we say, Lord, your affairs. We're asking that your Holy Spirit will direct us, lead us, and guide us, and show us, Lord, how as we uh, get older and we make preparation for retirement, if we're not already retired, how those resources can not only benefit us here and benefit those while we're here, but even, Lord, should you tarry and we go to sleep, those resources can still continue to be used for your glory. Lord, forgive us. We have made mistakes, and we all have, Lord. There's not one under our breath who's not made bad decisions before. Forgive us where we have fallen short. But we want to ask that you, being the great traffic director, will allow us to make a U-turn so that when we have done things wrong in the past, we can make better decisions in the future. Please accept our worship. Bless us throughout this week. And keep us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This man.